Hello, I am Fritz Outman, and this is October 22nd, 2020. Welcome to my free correct execution instructional video tutorial for my advanced overall mechanical execution finalized Outman methodology rotational pitching on the vertical plane employing static stance starting positioning. This instructional video tutorial is going to be very detailed in nature. So if you're just viewing this casually, that's fine. Watch as much or as little as you wish. If you're viewing this with the intent of teaching someone else how to master my methodology, or more importantly, more specifically, if you yourself are viewing for the purpose of gaining mastery over my methodology, go no farther. If you have not viewed and understand the following topics, some of which I may leave out, and if I mention them later on in the video tutorial, which I will be, you'll have to stop and go to www.outmanmethodology.com to familiarize yourself with those topics. First of all, you need to know what is vertical plane pitching. You need to know what is crossing your belt line, second base rule, scapular loading, the snowflake effect, the moments of greatest leverage, the dissipation of deleterious force, the importance of eliminating linear movement that occurs before rotational acceleration, the uh, uh, relationship between constants, consistency, and the removal of slack. You need to understand the hazards and deficiencies of long stride, wide base, drive from your rear foot pitching mechanics. You need to know the muscles that are primarily focused on an execution of my methodology. Pitching a baseball is not something toward which human beings gravitate toward naturally any, anyway, and my methodology deviates far from what people gravitate toward to th in throwing or pitching a baseball. You need to know those muscles, where they are in your body, and you need to understand that those muscles are not going to be activated on their own. You, need to, you will need to train your brain and your body to employ those muscles specifically. Your brain then will recruit additional muscles toward the purpose, the goal of contracting the muscles specific to employ my methodology. And that brings me to the topic of specific employ. We can contract muscles just to be contracting them without any particular purpose. You will be contracting your muscles toward a specific goal. You're going to be pitching on a vertical plane toward moving torso, lower body, and so forth. Those muscles need to be conditioned as well. So you should visit my blog site at www.outmanmethodology.com and view the Outman Methodology Sport of Baseball Pitcher Specific Functional Conditioning and Training Regimen. You can have a Ferrari with a high performance engine in it and put low grade, low octane gasoline in that the tank of that uh, for that engine, and that engine will not perform up to its capacity. In fact, you probably would damage that engine. My methodology is like the Ferrari of pitching mechanics. It cannot be improved upon now that I have arrived at static stance starting positioning. It is the best, the highest performing, most efficient, most effective, least complex, meaning the most simple and least injurious employer than human physiology that ever has been or ever will be engineered in the history of the sport of baseball anywhere on planet Earth. Nevertheless, that is essentially the engine, but if your fuel, meaning your muscles, are weak, fl you're flabby, you're out of shape, you will not be able to take advantage of having mastered my methodology in terms of its correct execution. So the better conditioning you are in, specific to my methodology, the better you will pitch, and then you will be able to truly uh, explore to and achieve to whatever is your personal capacity, talent, and ability for pitching a baseball. It is the, again, the least injurious employed the human physiology for pitching a baseball. I'm not going to be elaborating on the various topics that I mentioned, and I'm sure that I left one or two out that are uh, critical knowledge for going forward. I'm not going to elaborate further on the, the health of the pitcher uh, uh, benefits of my methodology. That is also to be found at www.outmanmethodology.com. So if you're prepared, 
go forward from here. If not, go to my blog site and review. Let's get started. The first stage is establishing your static stance starting positioning. The distance between your feet, how you position your feet, how you support your weight. And taking signs from that positioning. This is extremely important because your starting uh, static stance starting positioning is the first moment of greatest leverage out of three moments of greatest leverage. I'm a little under six foot one inch tall now. I was a little over six one in my youth, but gravity and age have lost a little bit. That's about 184 centimeters. Uh, the distance between the, the inside of my rear foot, that's my rear pivot foot, and mind you, I'm a right hander, so left handers just reverse everything that I'm, uh, we'll be teaching you in this and apply it to your left handedness. Rear pivot foot, imagine it's, there's a pitcher's plate back there and the back edge of my foot is, is flush with the front edge of the pitcher's plate, my front foot stepping out. At my height and my body proportion, the distance that is right for me, correct for me, gives me the most leverage and doesn't overextend the length of my, my, the space between my rear pivot foot and my front pivot foot is three to three and a quarter feet. That'd be roughly, I think, 92 to about 99 centimeters. I'm telling you that not because that's any formula you should use. I'm just telling you that because that's what applies to me. But someone my identical height with longer legs would have a lot greater space between your feet. Someone with a longer torso would have less space between your feet. In other words, there's no formula. There is what is right for your body. Now, how do you gauge that? You gauge that by, if you spread your feet too far, you're, you're stuck in place. You, you can't rotate your pelvis. If you feel like you're doing the splits, you're too far. If your feet are too close together, when it comes time to initiate rotational acceleration, you have no leverage. Your feet are too close together and you are not able to really torque your pelvis around and work it around through rotational acceleration and execution. So you have to, you have to play with this and in doing so, find a separation between your feet where you almost feel like you can sit down and you've got some latitude and you can sit a little bit and feel comfortable. Now, with your front foot, you always can keep the heel of your front pivot foot elevated. That's gonna go through the entire delivery until you're executing your sideways crab walk follow through steps. So you have to flex that calf muscle, the front pivot leg, and keep the heel elevated and the weight on the ball and the bottom of the great toe of your front pivot foot. Your rear pivot foot, the weight that is on your rear foot pivot foot must be focused on the inner edge of your rear pivot foot, of the heel, back on the heel. Just imagine you're trying to crush something with the heel, but then rotate that foot parallel to the front edge of the pitcher's plate, rotate your rear pivot knee in a little bit, and the ankle. See, that puts the pressure on the inner edge of your foot, and then focus it on the heel, and you maintain that until you initiate rotational acceleration later in the delivery. So here's your static stance starting positioning. For me, it's in this range is going to be three to three and a quarter feet in that 92 to 90, 98, 99 centimeter. But that's not anything to gauge for you. It depends upon your body proportionality, your physical height, and the length of your legs in relationship to your torso. Taller people might be, will be longer likely, shorter may, people may be a little shorter or shorter legs. Then take your signs. I, this is how I like to take my signs. I just put my glove hand on my, the thigh of my front pivot leg. I feel my, I'm digging that weight in on the inner edge of the heel of my rear pivot foot. I got my heel of my front pivot foot up, take my signs. After that, I'm going to go to set. So this is critically important because it is your first moment of greatest leverage. You'll have to experiment with it. There's no other way around that. 
This is how you want to set up your static stance starting positioning. Next, we'll go to set. All right, I'll get back into the, my static stance length, the space between my feet, weight on the inner edge of the heel, the rear pivot foot, heel up on the front pivot foot, my distance, my sitting down a little bit for my leverage, I can feel it, I can turn my, my rotate my pelvis, I'm not locked up at all, but I also feel I've got some leverage in there that I can, that I can employ. So I've taken signs, we go to set. When you go to set, you bring your, the ball and the, and the pitching hand and the glove together, bring it back to your, rear, your pitching shoulder, back here, and maybe just a little bit above. This is going to be the shortest distance between two points as far as a starting place for you to deliver your pitching arm and your glove arm to their final ready positions which also constitutes the second moment of greatest leverage. So you take your signs, you already got your stance, you bring your hands up to this position and just relax your arms in. At the same time, you, well, before I show you the arching, you shrug. That is using the upper aspect of the trapezius muscle on either side of your neck, and just like you're doing with, a, if you had a weight bar and you're doing shrugs, you shrug and you hold that shrug. How long do you hold it? You hold it until you cannot shrug any longer. With the glove arm, that's gonna be a lot sooner than with the pitching arm. You shrug because this assists in getting your shoulder up for verticality. It also helps keep the, the deltoid muscles in your, in your pitching shoulder relaxed so you can get your most external, uh, maximum external rotation later on. Shrug. So you're taking your signs and you're bringing your hands up to your set position, pitching position, shrug. So now I'm shrugging. At the same time, you're going to arch your back rearward. Now I can't do this sufficiently anymore. In the last couple of years, just age has taken away more and more and, and injuries that I've had, not from baseball, but uh, severe injuries from my ability to get my back hyperextended which affects the, my ability to get the humerus of my pitching arm shoulder to elbow vertical to the ground. I'm still able to get from elbow to fingertips, but on a rare occasion can I get true verticality of the humerus and all the way to the fingertips. But in any case, you arch rearward. Don't arch so far back you feel like you're falling over, but so you sit down, arch rearward, and you're shrugging. So putting it all together, I've got my stance, I'm coming to set, I'm shrugging, and I'm arching rearward. That's set. That's how you get from taking signs to set. Next, we'll address initiating or de delivering your pitching arm and your glove arm to their final ready position and the second moment of greatest leverage. So now we're going to address delivering your pitching arm and your glove arm to their respective final ready positions, which constitutes the second moment of greatest leverage. And it is from the second moment of, great, moment of greatest leverage that you will initiate and accomplish rotational acceleration. That's when you really get into actually pitching the baseball. Static stance, positioning, distance between the front pivot foot and the rear pivot foot, signs, going to set, shrugging, arching, hands up, back by your pitching shoulder, and just a little bit above. Heel up on your front pivot foot, weight of your rear pivot that's supporting your rear pivot leg, support it in and really feel it on that inner edge of the rear pivot heel. All right, we're gonna, I'm gonna start with the pitching arm. So from set, I'm gonna drop my glove so you can see. From set, you're going to take your pitching arm to its final ready position, not down in this manner, which you're probably 
accustomed to doing. You have muscle memory to overcome. Not across your body in this manner, but from here, just take the elbow straight up like you're hitchhiking, but then the momentum is gonna take your pitching arm out to here. The reason you don't bring your arm downward or even sweep it parallel to the ground is by the time you deliver your glove arm to its final ready position, the first moment of greatest leverage, your arm, your shoulder will be too low. It won't be where it needs to be and you won't be achieving verticality. And it's going to have an adverse effect on your velocity, your command, and the movement of the pitch baseball on its flight to the catcher. Let me just backtrack something I want to mention here and it has to do with getting your your uh, the length between the distance between your feet and the, and the static stand starting positioning when you have that and you sit down you're also removing slack from your delivery you're also creating a constant constants produce consistency all along in my my methodology you're removing slack you're producing constants constants produce consistency variables produce variability or inconsistency of result. But we want to be sure that we're eliminating range of movement that is going to be detrimental. If you haven't read about that, you should. You can find that on, on my blog site at www.outmymethodology.com. So with a pitching arm, you're going to take your arm back hitchhiking, in a manner of hitchhiking, use the external rotator cuff, you're going to flex your, your biceps muscle a little bit, and is this is rapidly done. This is not just leisurely. When you part your hands, it's rapidly done. And once you hit the extent that you can, there the limit of extending your pitching arm, you have taken all the slack out of this range here is no longer in between, it's out here. And you set yourself up by continuing to shrug to elevate your pitching shoulder along with your hyperextending or your back or arching rearward. This is your final ready position for your pitching arm. For your glove arm, you flip your glove arm skyward rapidly. You make a little bit of a fist in your glove. That's to keep the palm up and to prevent your wrist from rotating down toward the palm down toward the ground. You use the triceps mu muscles on the back of the upper arm of your glove arm. Flip your glove arm skyward until you feel your elbow has extend it as far as it can. You're going to feel a little bit of hyperextension, a bounce. And when you hit that bounce, that's a constant. And that has also taken the slack of, out of the range of movement from here, from here to here. Additionally, as soon as you feel your elbow hyperextend, you contract the glove side latissimus dorsi muscle. You should know where that is, right under here and start pulling your glove arm down in this fashion. Don't pull it with your biceps because your biceps will not engage the latissimus dorsi muscle. Pull it down with your latissimus dorsi muscle which will engage your biceps. And your arm will be extended about like so and just a little bit above parallel to the ground is where you're going to find your have taken all the slack out that you need at that point. This is your second moment of greatest leverage, and it has dissipated the deleterious force that you generate by flipping your glove arm out in this fashion. You flip it out, you grab the lat, and you're right here. Now, the two together, it's just that quickly. Now, it'll vary a little bit in time because of the snowflake effect. You have to get a feel for this by reason of repetition. You might, there might be, take you a little bit, sometimes you'll, there'll be a noticeable pause. Somebody watching you pitch will see you kind of pause right in this position because you're getting to that second moment of greatest leverage. Other times it just happens really quickly. You feel it, it's kind of notched in there, there's a daytime position, and from there you're going to initiate rotational acceleration. Now, again, flip your glove arm skyward rapidly. Grab, when you hit hyperextension, you do the flipping with the gloves, the uh, uh, triceps muscles on the back of the upper arm of your glove arm. Keep a fist in your glove that prevents rotation of your wrist inward. Palm up, hyperextension, 
contract the glove side lats to pull your arm into this position. Your, your biceps will join in, will be recruited between this and this. And you, you will no longer be shrugging at this point with your glove arm, but you will be shrugging with your pitching arm. So this is where you end up, final ready position, second moment of greatest leverage. Now we're going to move to initiating rotational acceleration. So if you're vague on anything that we've covered to this point, roll it back and watch it again. This is complicated, but it's not nearly so complicated as any other employee of the human physiology for pitching a baseball. It's simple when you get down to it, but your, your challenge is going to be to, to overcome muscle memory that you already have. One of your big challenges is going to be preventing your taking your arm down and are up and around, or parallel. You're gonna to have to learn how to keep those up, the upper aspect of the trapezius muscle. If you're left-hander, it's on the, right, uh, right, on the left side. If you're right-hander, it's on the right side. And pull it up. Hitchhike your arm out. It, when you take your elbow out, you notice your arm is still gonna go down this way, but you have brought it from this direction as opposed to this. And we're achieving or establishing verticality in terms of the pathway for the arm, and you can't do that swinging your arm like that or your glove arm out this way. This is all establishing verticality of movement and a pathway. So we've uh, covered first moment of greatest leverage, the static stance starting positioning, where you hold your weight, how you position your feet, taking signs, getting to set, delivering your arms to the final ready position, and next, is initiating rotational acceleration. Okay, so how do you do that? You initiate rotational acceleration by initiating crossing your belt line. For a right-hander like me, that's from the right side obliques across to the front obliques to the, or the right side obliques to the front oblique abdominal muscles, front abdominal muscles, then to the right abdominal muscles. You don't just tweak the your glove side obliques, you contract them hard and you don't stop there, you work all the way across your belt line. This is to assist in rotating and accelerating your pelvis, the pitching side of your pelvis into the direction of the catcher. That's how you start rotational acceleration from the second moment of greatest leverage. I'm starting here. After, and you, you will learn, eventually your brain will be able to track your muscle movements in real time. But after you establish your crossing your belt line, which for me is, I feel I've moved from my, my glove side oblique. You don't stop contracting, you can't. You have to contract all the way across because it's just like an accordion pulling in. The muscles keep contracting all the way across. But I feel my front abs beginning to contract. And that would be about the timing of what you do next as part of rotational acceleration. And that is, simultaneously, you're going to explosively contract that glove side latissimus dorsi muscle to drive your glove elbow down toward the ground and rearward of the glove side of your body. And then it's going to, the momentum and torque and torsion you produce is going to whip your glove arm out like that toward uh, achieving scapular loading. You do that with the glove side latissimus dorsi muscle, you don't initiate that with the triceps muscles on the back of your glove arm because you can, you can contract your triceps muscles and your latissimus dorsi muscle will not activate. But if you activate your gl glove side latissimus dorsi muscle, your triceps will be recruited and join in. So you can do this experiment at, at, on your own I'm gonna show you the difference between, between driving, sweeping your glove elbow rearward towards second base, all the way to second base. That's the, that's the mindset you have. It's sort of like in martial arts where you are told to drive through, punch through the target, not to it. Well, this is the same concept with uh, pitching, my pitching methodology. Everything is second base rule, rotating your pitching side of your pelvis. You imagine you're rotating all the way around the second base. You'll never get there 
but that's your objective, the second base rule. So activating the triceps, this is what kind of a kind of ex, uh, accelerating force producing acceleration you, you uh, or uh, muscle contraction you get with the triceps on the back of the upper arm, your glove arm. Now watch what happens when I use, I start with the latissimus dorsi muscle, big muscle, and the triceps join in. Now that's not feigned movement on my part. That's what happens. That's the amount of torque you generate with this big muscle and the smaller ones joining in. Now I'll translate that into velocity as it relates to scapular loading, so-called scapular loading. So that's one muscle that you activate simultaneously. And what you're going to find out when, as you're learning this, some things you do better than others. So you'll have to determine what muscles seem like they work more automatically for you and focus on the ones that don't. I've always been weak at rotating the rear side of my body. So I typically focus on that and join in. Even though it's simultaneous, I join in with the glove side lat. So and it's simultaneous with the glove side lat, you, you've done this. Your pitching arm is up here. You're shrugging. It's in this final ready position back here. You then explosively contract the inner thigh muscles of your rear pivot leg, the groin, inner thigh, and the muscles on the outside of the calf of your rear pivot leg to do two things, to rotate the knee of your rear pivot leg in the direction of the catcher, but thinking you're kind of taking it all the way around to second base, and the same with the heel of your rear pivot foot, outward, rapidly, explosively. So from, from this position, I'm going to do this discreetly here, separately. I'm crossing the belt line. I feel like the muscles of the front abs are beginning to contract. That's my cue to explosively contract inner thigh muscles and groin of the rear pivot leg and the outer calf muscles on the outside of the calf. Knee in, heel out around. And with this, then, I second moment of greatest leverage, I'm crossing my belt line, now the lats and inner thigh muscles out like that. So that's something on which you have to work. I'm going to take a moment here to interject the importance of your core strength. On my Outman Methodology Sport of Baseball Pitcher Specific Functional Conditioning and Training Regimen, I show how I use a machine to strengthen the front abs and either one where you're kneeling or one you wrap your arms around to work the obliques. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate on why, but I had a, a situation where I needed to have some physical therapy. So I went to the, these, the physical therapy sessions and on one occasion I asked the physical therapist what she thought, how she would evaluate my core strength because I knew that I worked out hard. And she told me, your core strength is good, but it could be better. My response was, explain to me how it could be better and teach me how to make it better. So she gave me two exercises to use. And she explained that when you do the exercises that I have on my uh, sport of baseball, pitcher-specific pitcher functional conditioning and training regimen, you're working obliques that are on the surface, but there's a deeper, there are deeper oblique muscles. I don't remember the name she gave him. It doesn't matter. It only matters that she told me that those could be strengthened and taught me how to do it. So for the past several years, I've been using those exercises and I noticed as I got better and better at doing that and it's strengthening those muscles and improvement in my, my velocity and just being able to rotate my pelvis. So I'm going to take a moment to demonstrate those two exercises for you, and then you can uh, uh, use them on your own and add them to the, my functional conditioning and training regimen. And then we'll move on to the next part of rotational acceleration, having to do with what you're going to, how you're going to employ your pitching arm and the pitching side of your body to the release point of the baseball. So let's do those, take a break, a moment, and do, I'll show you those two exercises. 
Okay, you saw the, the uh, transition coming, uh, the bird dog. This particular exercise has a name, the other one doesn't, but it's called the bird dog. And the way you execute it is you get on your hands and knees, put your hands down about shoulder width, comfortable distance, you know, under your chin, and you do one side and then the other. And the way you do it is you extend one arm out, and on the opposite side, you extend your leg out. Now, I worked up to doing this for a minute, and now I just do it 30 seconds uh, each side five, six times a week. Now, there are a couple of points with this. You don't allow your pelvis to raise up. You get your pelvis parallel to the ground. You use your glutes to try to extend your leg as far as you can, and then you use your shoulder deltoid muscles to extend your arm. Now, you can put your head down or put your head up. For me, it's more comfortable kind of halfway in between, but you hold this. Now, when you've done, worked up to a minute, you're gonna be pretty strong, because it's not easy to do, especially when you got a shoe on. I do it oftentimes just barefoot. When you've made your time, you bring your knee down and your hand down, and you switch, and you do the other side. You get your pelvis parallel to the ground, you extend your leg, Send your arm, and you hold that. So that is going to work a deeper layer of oblique muscles than what you can get when you do these exercises uh, on, on a machine. Bird dog, do that. Next is one that's even more difficult. I like it, it's extremely, it was extremely hard for me to, to be able to uh, master, so to speak, but that one's coming up next. Okay, you see I have a chair. You can use, I was told by the physical therapist, you could use a table or, uh, but a chair is, is best for me. I think it's probably best for anybody. And it should have, you know, either be padded like this is, or put a pillow or something on, not too thick, but just something because it gets uncomfortable, especially when you're an old guy like me. I'm 70 at this point. Uh, it's hard on the knees otherwise. Okay, so this has no name, or at least I wasn't given a name, but you balance, I don't know which is the best way to do it, I'll do it this way. When I first started out, I couldn't hold a position for five seconds. Now understand, you're dealing with the Earth rotating on its axis at, as measured at the equator about 1,000, 1,050 miles an hour, I don't, I don't know what that translates into the kilometers, uh, and the earth wobbles. So that's why even when we're standing still, we don't realize it, but we're adjusting. We'll sway a little bit when you have your just standing in position. Worse on the ocean or water because of the, the waves. But that's what you're, you're battling to keep balance. But in the process, you're working those deep oblique muscles. So you do this on both sides, similar to the bird dog, you switch. When I first started, I had to hang on to the chair like this and then try to get my leg out and then, and then try to hold my balance. As time passed, I was able to do that and I learned a, a few tricks. Just by experimentation, I learned that if you pull your toe in toward your knee on both feet, I'll stick this one out so you can see it because it's gonna be over here. That helps take the slack out of your muscles and makes it easier to control what you're doing. At any rate, it took a long time for me to be able to do uh, a minute, and, I was, and then I'd have to start over because I, I was cheating if I pulled my knee in or my, pulled my hands and that kind of thing. And I'd always hold on. Now, I just do 30 seconds, I count it in my head, and I typically don't need even to hold. I just kneel on the chair, I get my position, and there's going to be hand waving, and you're going to balance out. I do this for 30 seconds. And then when I'm done on that side, I just switch knees, and I come out for another 30 seconds. Toes up to the knees on both feet. I have experiment with hands out here, out here, and I just find that if you have your palms down, or my, for me, and I just wave them back and forth, and I'm wobbling because the earth is wobbling, and my body is reacting to it, and I'm called on to react to that and stabilize. And my obliques are very, very strong, where even if I get out that far off balance, I'm most times able to recover. 
there's no way I could do that before I'd be dropping my feet on the floor and on my balance. So core strength is key. It's critical in executing my methodology and the strength of all the other muscles and not just physical strength. It needs to be medium to medium long, quick twitch muscles, which in my uh, functional conditioning and training regimen, I explained, you want to be like Mr. Universe? Fine. Those are short, compact muscles and they're not any good for baseball and you're going to be injured. You need muscles that are, are developed for baseball and it does, those aren't just for pitching, that's for base running, fielding and batting because with baseball it's the explosive movement for the bat, explosive movement to throw, to pitch, explosive movement to steal bases, it, the first two steps to feel the ball. So those, that type of musculature functionally applicable to the sport of baseball is what needs to be developed and develop it as far and as, as best as you can. All right, having shown you those and talked about the importance of core strength and how you can make it even better than uh, what you might think, let's move on to what you do with your pitching arm and continue to do with your body on rotational acceleration to the release point of the baseball from the fingertips of your pitching hand. So we're back now to finish up on the pitching delivery. You've already initiated rotational acceleration, starting with crossing your belt line. Left-hander, you'll be crossing this way, and your feet will be, will be different. You'll be in this way with your rear pivot foot. So explosive contraction, explosive contraction of the latissimus dorsi muscle to sweep your glove arm downward and rearward to second base, side of your glove, side of your body. Explosive contraction, inner thigh muscles, groin muscles, muscles on the outside of the calf of the rear pivot leg to rotate the knee in and heel in. Really explosive, hard, complete, all the way to second base. That's what you're trying to do. I liken it to wringing out a washcloth. You wet it and you've got counter rotation and torque. You're wringing that water out. Well, this is what you're doing. Your upper body's going this way, your lower body's going this way, and your upper body is still going back. It's kind of fighting in the middle of the scapulae, in the middle of your back, because with this movement and this movement, then the next thing you're going to do is whip your pitching arm rearward as far as possible by reason of explosive from this positioning where you're shrugging, you explosively now contract that upper aspect of the trapezius muscle on your pitching side. Again, the left handers is here, right handers is there, against this movement back like that. So you're, you're rotating over. The glove side movement is helping to rotate the pelvis and the torso. The crossing your belt line is more for the pelvis, but it affects the torso, but it's a little lower, so it doesn't have as dramatic effect. This does. And this rotation of the heel outward, or the, pitch, the rear pivot heel outward and the, and the knee of the rear pivot leg inward is rotating the pelvis and it's doing something else. It is help, helping to be conforming with the physical law that no two objects of matter can occupy the same space at the same time. Now how that works in a body that's connected and everything's contiguous is if your pelvis is not completely rotated, your pitching shoulder, which is above the pelvis, can't rotate completely. So it's going to affect the pathway of your arm. It's going to come out. If you're right-handed, you might even drill a ball in the dirt or it's going to be up and in on a right-handed bat or left-handed the opposite. So this not only torques your pelvis around, it clears the pathway for your upper body and allows you to gain verticality. So when you are contracting, you're, cro you're crossing the belt line, again, don't just contract it to rotate your pelvis, contract it to rotate up and over. I failed to mention that in that segment, but better late than never. Up and over, specific reason for, rotate, for contracting those muscles in that manner. So you're already arched up and over, that helps deliver your pitching shoulder along with the shrugging and finally follow through to the release point of the baseball from your pitching hand up and over. So 
crossing your belt line, you start, you get toward the front abs, you explosively contract simultaneously these muscles, these muscles that rotate the back side, the glove side lat to draw your arm back. That's going to torque everything. Against that, once you've established that rotation of the rear pivot heel, you explosively contract up the upper aspect of the trapezius muscle to take your pitching arm like that. And that is going, those most right there, scapular loading, maxed out. If you fail to rotate that rear pivot heel and knee, you're not going to get as much and you're not going to have the velocity or the command or the movement. But if you do, you're going to get some awesome results. You're still contracting all those muscles across your stomach, the crossing the belt line, because you're still pulling through. That's how you load, if you want to call it, get scapular loading. Okay, the next segment is going to be on follow through to the release point of the baseball. The muscles you use at that point when you do that is the third moment of greatest leverage. Okay, third moment of greatest leverage occurs when you feel as the pitcher, your pitching shoulder, and this happens so fast at this point, it's, it's difficult to detect, but if you can, and you can, you can hold off explosively contracting the muscles that are going to accelerate your pitching arm forward uh, directly, then uh, you will have so much better result. But you, it feels as though you're leaning on your pitching shoulder, and it's a sensation. You might not, your shoulder might not actually be uh, facing down or beginning even to move down toward the ground, but it feels that way, and it's a function of how far you've, you've rotated the rear side and the glove arm and the tilt and, all, and the throwing your arm back that stretches everything out and makes like, it feels like everything is focused on that pitching shoulder. For a left-hander, it's going to be right here. For a right-hander, me, it's there. When you arrive at the third moment of greatest leverage, somewhere in here, maybe a little bit back here, it just depends on how it feels, you explosively contract from your glove side obliques. And a lot of this is going to happen kind of automatically because of the way you, you're the torsion and the torque and the movement and the momentum that you've already created. But if you could literally track it, it would be pitching side oblique, pitching side latissimus dorsi, serratus anterior right in here, the, your uh, uh, subscapularis muscle, which is, comes around from the back and the tendon attaches to the front of your rotator cuff to pull your arm this way, and that's a muscle that you want to focus on strengthening as well, explosive use, uh, quick twitch muscle, light, lighter weights, high rep, to rotate your arm forward, but to also pull your arm in, the lats, and that big pectoral muscle with the pectoralis major tendon attaching up here in the, uh, up on the top of the humerus, all those muscles, you're going to explosively contract and then followed by the triceps muscles on your pitching arm, back of your upper pitching arm, and the flexor muscles to draw your, the, your pitching hand even with the forearm, and then the, the flexor muscles to finish, and you, then your release, your grip and your release, that, or the release that you're going to execute. All the way to second base. And when you're doing that, the focus is up and over, up and over, let me get back here so my hand isn't disappearing out of the picture, up and over on the vertical plane, humerus to elbow, elbow to fingertips, perpendicular to the ground, and out into the glove of the catcher, down to the ground, and around the second base. So you're actually going to, as you're, when you feel that shoulder down, you're going to drive your shoulder first into the catcher's mitt, down, and your arm will follow out, down, over the top, up and over. Now think about this. What is the greatest, the angle of greatest leverage? What is the angle of greatest leverage? Some of you know this. It's 90 degrees. It's a right angle. What angle is formed between the ground and just me standing here, you standing here, 90 degrees. The floor is parallel, I'm 90 degrees, that's a right angle. 
And when your pitching arm is coming through a, a perpendicular arm slot, when you reach that third moment of greatest leverage, you will be co combining the third moment of greatest leverage with the angle of greatest leverage to pitch the baseball. So let's think about that. The moment of greatest, third moment of greatest leverage, the angle of greatest leverage, 90 degrees. You'll, you should be, now I include the photos on the website uh, and on, on the beginning of this uh, video tutorial, this free video tutorial of both my sons, different angles, my oldest son Josh from behind and my youngest son Zach from years ago. You don't have to be that young to be able to achieve verticality of your pitching arm, but that shows you what it's like. I, I could do it until really a couple of years ago. And, I, and on occasion, I, I do it now. I can tell by I, my fingertips clip my kneecap or the inside or the outside of my, uh, my uh, left calf or the shin bone. I know that I come straight over the top when that happens because there's no way for me to get from here to there without having my humerus straight up, not just my uh, elbow to fingertips, which on my site, the rear view, me pitching, you can see how I'm not making verticality, but that's do as I say, not as I do, because I could do it in the past, I just can't do it now. The next thing I'm just going to include in this, and no reason to break up the segment, you have followed through to the release point of the baseball, drive your shoulder, from the third moment of greatest leverage, you're taking, your, when your shoulder feels like it's you're leaning on it, you put it in the catcher's glove and extend out all these muscles that I already described. You can go back and review that. And make sure you finish with those forearm flexors and all the way to second base. Now, the torsion and the torque and the momentum that is produced in correct execution in my methodology causes you to be pulled forward. Flat ground or on a mound. And if you're on a mound, in my case, if I'm doing it correctly and it's a good mound where I have the correct, right, correct slope and drop off, uh, seven follow through crab walk steps. These are dissipating the force that remains after the ball has released from your hand, but they're not contrived, they are irresistible. And I call them side, sideways crab walk follow through steps because you're crab walking like this. And you can see that on the videos on my blog site. So I probably left something out, uh, undoubtedly, there's so much to cover, but if, and just with the crab walk follow through steps, that will be the first time that your front pivot heel touches the ground if you're executing correctly. If you don't drop your heel, you're adding, you're changing your, your front knee, the angle of it, you're changing everything that happens behind it, you're adding slack to your delivery, you're taking away a constant, Constance, consistency, removal of slack, dissipation of deleterious force, and so forth. So again, I probably left something out somewhere along the line, but I, between what's on my site and what's here and videos, you should be able to gain mastery over this. Again, this is free, so everybody, anywhere, wherever you are in the world, you don't have to pay anything for this. Uh, I haven't set up yet any means by which to be able to do uh, view review of any videos consultatively. I don't know when that's going to happen, if it's going to happen. Uh, but if, if and when it does, it will be uh, available through the same page that on my blog that at www.outmymethodology.com that links to this YouTube video tutorial. So that, if you're serious about finding out how good of a pitcher you can be, uh, covers everything, get yourself in the proper conditioning for it, uh, work hard, focus on, find out what are your strengths, focus on your weaknesses, that'll be a battle back and forth. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort, it takes talent, it takes dedication, determination, self-motivation. But if you have all those, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to go out eventually and outpitch anybody you probably know, especially if they're, you're similarly talented 
and they're employing conventional mechanical approach for pitching a baseball or any other mechanical approach for pitching a baseball. With that said, all this, take, all this addressed, as usual, I wish you the best in all your baseball pitching endeavors. I am Fritz Altman, and that concludes my free correct execution instructional video tutorial relative to my methodology.